count down to the last comic shop in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hey, hey! It is now time for the last comic shop! <laughs> we are from outer space and we are invading your space. Okay. Really? Uh, yeah. You can be that guy, or you can just be the guy who comes in and wants to talk about comic books and, you know, open some <laughs> long boxes. That's right. We're opening the shop up to newbies, people who don't know anything about comics and want to learn. We're keeping it open for the oldies and the moldies and the robots and everyone else that wants right. to read about comic books, too. Well, I mean, it's the beginning of the Halloween season. Welcome back to The Last Comic Shop. I'm the host with the most, Andy Larson. I'm joined by Jay Scott and Chad Smith. And as I said, all this month on the last comic shop, we are going to be doing spooky and horror related books. And one of my favorite subgenres is the sci-fi horror. I'm I'm honestly not a blood and guts guy. So like anytime you can incorporate space into horror, whether it's even, you know, going back to the 1950s and things like it came from outer space or uh, the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers or the original The Thing that was done by Howard Hawks them with the giant ants the Those blob are, where was that filmed in pennsylvania where was that filmed the diner like used to be somewhere near where we went to college it isn't very far from from our backyard uh even uh night of the living dead i even put that in the sci-fi horror because it's kind of like radiation causes something i don't know and that was that was filmed in our backyard too but we don't have the budget for sci-fi so we have to do the next best thing we can't go into space so we'll go underwater today. Ooh. Oh, yes. But there's some good ones there, too. Jaws, uh, The Deep, The Abyss. I don't think anything gets better than The Abyss. That's probably the best. I mean, if, you, if you're if you on the scale of movies and TV shows set in the ocean, at one end is Sequest DSV, <laughs> and at the other end is The Abyss. <laughs> Where does the love boat fall in? Oh. Squarely in the center. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Chad's right. We are going to be kicking off our Halloween season here uh, with the last comic shop's uh, review of a comic book that was written by Joe Hill, who you might know as the author of Lock and Key, which was an extremely popular comic book series that was then adapted into a TV show over at Netflix. He also happens to be Stephen King's son, so he comes from good pedigree in terms of telling horror. And ultimately, this week's book is one that was released back in 2019, and it was called Plunge. It's got the fantastic Stuart Eminem on art. I know that was a treat for Chad because he loves he loves some good old fashioned Stuart. Oh yeah, it's good stuff. But yeah, this was part of an initiative, as we'll get to after the commercial break, that was done by DC in 2019 uh, to put more horror comic books out on the market, for, especially from one of the big two publishers. Uh, it was part of Hill House Comics, which was a kind of like a subdivision similar to Vertigo or Young Animal. But before we get to that, it's time to get down to business. The business of recapping weekly polls. Yes. Periodically here on The Last Comic Shop, we like to go back to our Twitter page, at Last Comic Shop, and Jay is going to find the results of some of our weekly polls that he is uh, gracious enough to put out on the interwebs every single week that you can vote in. All of these polls, I think, happened within the month of August. Jay, what was our first poll from this period? All right, so our first poll uh, coincided with the review of Lauren Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. What is your favorite LGBTQ film? Uh, the four that we featured were Love, Simon, Happy Together, E2 Mama Tambien, and The Birdcage. Okay, so what ultimately won that poll? The Birdcage came home with about 43%. You know, it's probably the most mainstream of the four. Right. Uh, Love, Simon's rather newer movie, Happy Together, is a Hong Kong film. I, I just noticed that two of the four are not in English. So I don't know if that affected <laughs> poll numbers or not. But uh, Hey, foreign films, baby. Just because they're not in your language doesn't mean you shouldn't check them out. Exactly. I, you know, I, not throwing shade on anyone who loves 
watching movies, but a, a lot of these movie podcasts and websites that review movies tend to just review like blockbuster dreck. <laughs> You know, if you're going to review movies on a podcast, put your money where your mouth is, invest in a subscription to the Criterion channel, and watch some great movies. Uh, You can watch the other stuff, too, but, you know, watch Elevator to the Gallows. Watch 400 Blows. Watch The Fortress. Right? Well, yeah, the Birdcage won this one. I voted for that one, too, because uh, yeah. I like Nat- Nathan Lane. I-, I always liked Nathan Lane. I liked him as in The Producers, him and Matthew Broderick. That was I like that movie, too. Anyways, what was our next poll, J.A.? So this coincided with our last Ronin Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles review, Best Pizza Topping. I was trying to get in sort of how many people are going to vote for the Hawaiian pizza. <gasps> Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I did tomato and basil a bit dirty. I think they only got 4% of the vote. Uh, the other two, the big ones, the ones that took a lot of the vote were pepperoni with 54% and sausage. Those are the Those, classics. Right. It was hard for me because they're not exclusive from each other. Like, my favorite pizza is one that incorporates both pepperoni and sausage. You like the pizza. The I, I do pizza. like the pizzas. I mean, I voted for Italian sausage, actually, because if I, I prefer an Italian sausage pizza if I have to have to make the choice. I don't know where the love wasn't for the, the, the pineapple pizza. That thing is wonderful. Pineapple, ham. You can't beat that pizza. What do you think, Chad? I, I love all the pizza toppings. I think they're great. But uh, a sad thing I have to admit is I'm a little bit like Kevin McAllister. My favorite pizza, plain cheese pizza. It's the best. Put some pepper flakes on there. I, I always loved, you go to the pizzeria, and you get the slice out of the oven, you sit down, the pepper flake shaker, the oregano shaker. Ooh. Ah, you're an oregano man. You know, it's another pizza that not, I, I'm actually a huge fan of. I like the white pizzas. I really oh, do. Yeah. I like a good white pizza. Sometimes I'm not in the mood for sauce, and uh, especially ones with, like, broccoli or, or things like that, it's... I could eat that all day, actually. It's it a tricks very... you into thinking that you're eating healthy. Exactly! And I <laughs> like it. It's eating my vegetables, and I didn't even know I was eating my vegetables. See? Yeah, my go. mama would be proud. Any case, what was our third poll, Jay Hay? Well, while we're talking about all things green, favorite Hulk opponent? Ooh. Abomination? Wolverine? The Red Hulk? Or The Thing? Oh, I am so mad that you did the leader dirty on this. <laughs> I mean, it's a great poll, and there's not five choices. But, like, you picked all the ones that punch the Hulk versus the the leader who doesn't punch the Hulk, just messes with the Hulk like Lex Luthor messes with Superman, which I think is more effective. Anytime you got brains versus brawn, man, that's the, that's the classic matchup. But, Chad, who do you think won it? I'm going to go Abomination. Ooh. The Mio See, Blonsky uh, co-star She-Hulk currently. I would go The Thing. That's who I voted for because I'll take a Thing Hulk slobber knocker anytime. But I, I doubt that he did. There's, It probably went to the most popular dude on this poll. Of course, yes. It, it's a pure popularity contest. It's going to Wolverine every ah. day, all day. And, and, and we'll see this repeated ad nauseum in our polls if there's an X-Men in the poll versus non-X-Men characters, you go with the X-Men. The X-Men are winning every day, day in and day out. <laughs> I mean, there are some really good Wolverine fights. And there's that Todd McFarlane one where you basically see Hulk's reflection in Wolverine's claws. There's the other one where they're both in tuxedos standing next to each other. Wolverine's first appearance in 181, or actually it was 180. I think he appears in 180 and then has a cover appearance in 181. But I think of the ultimate Wolverine Hulk fight where the ultimate Hulk tears him in two. Yes. And there was also a really great one that not a lot of people know about in Savage Wolverine, drawn by Frank Cho. And you have this picture of Hulk's head and Wolverine's got one claw coming down through his forehead. The other one coming through where his ear is. It is so brutal. I don't think <laughs> I've seen his, that. like his back and he's just like, no, I'm, I'm not letting go, Hulk. Like one is in your brain this way. The other one's in your brain this way. And I'm riding to you to you to you die. <laughs> but that reminds me of uh, Old Man Wolverine. Yeah. Yes, the bad guy. That's what I was going to say where it, it, 
There's so much bad going on with that Hulk. That's not a Hulk I like. No, but isn't you don't like inbreeding one? Hulk? Yeah. Doesn't he? Doesn't he eat Wolverine in that one? Comes out his stomach. Yeah. Yep. All right. What's uh, what was our fourth poll, JA? This coincided with the Nightwing series we read. Best Robin. Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Tim Drake, or Damian Wayne? Mm. All right, Chad. Who would you vote for? So growing up, my answer would have always been Dick Grayson, just because like he was the original Robin. But the problem was he actually developed into his own interesting character in Nightwing. And so by the time uh, Tim Drake comes along, I felt like Tim Drake embodied the best of the Robins. You know, he was the detective. He was the one that was that seemed the most like Batman and his successor. So my money's on Tim Drake. I, I, I picked good old Dick just simply because you can't go wrong with the original. Did I did most of the other fans agree with me? They did, though I didn't agree with most of the other fans or you. Sixty-three <laughs> percent picked Dick Grayson. I went Jason Todd because I think that DC and the general world did Jason Todd dirty. <laughs> Uh, they did vote for him to die. So, yes, I yes. mean, that's if yes. you're going to throw shade on anybody saying here, I will pay money for you to kill this character. I think yes. that's throwing some massive shade somewhere. He was I mean, in a no win situation, right? No one's going to like the guy who succeeds the original guy. Yeah. True. All all the shit that Jason Todd had to go through. Tim Drake just Jason Todd laid down for Tim Drake to be able to fly. Oh, I see how it is. He stole the wheels off the Batmobile. That's not a good start. <laughs> the bad boy Robin. Let's get Jason Todd. He's the Bucky Barnes Robin. He'll he'll assassinate people. And that's that's actually why I don't like Jason Todd because I feel like he's just a retread of everything they did with Winter Soldier. They're like, yeah, let's bring back Bucky. Let's do Winter Soldier. Let's do that. And then they did, and it was awesome and then they were like let's do the exact same thing with jason todd and i'm yeah, like, I like i'm talking late. about him as robin the original not 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 the retcon crap today yeah but that's the problem with jason like he had two retcons like they introduced him and they're like no 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 he's too much like dick grayson let's change him to a street tough stealing right. batman's tires and now let's kill him with a hotline <laughs> <laughs> man I think most characters at comic books should be voted on whether they're going to die. It creates controversy, and it's, it's memorable. Dang it. It's memorable. Any case, last poll, J.A. Speaking of things that are memorable, who wins in a fight? And shout out to the Ninja Turtle nerds at TMNT Nerds on Twitter, because they are the ones who came up the the actual answer, which is, Whosever's name is on the cover, as the great Stan Lee would say. Yes. Who's ever writing the book, that's who wins. Right. And I think that's Chad's answer to any single versus <laughs> oh, question. Yeah. Yes. On our old show, we would do versus segments all the time, and I hated it just because it's like, it doesn't matter. Whoever's making the book, they're the ones that are going to tell you who's going to win. It's yeah. the story that matters. Right. So who, who wins this story, J.A.? So it, it actually came down to uh, the Kryptonians versus the X-Men with, I think, everyone saying, well, obviously for raw power, Justice League is bringing it because whenever you have Superman in your corner, you've, you've got a pretty heavy hitter. But I think X-Men came out above because they're saying, oh, it's the mental, right? You've got Professor X and on all the mental stuff. Though I got to say, Andrew had a good point. You just need like eight to ten pages of distraction exposition while Mr. Fantastic cooks up something that neutralizes everybody. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's sincerely all really the thing, the human torch, and especially Invisible Woman. Especially Invisible Woman. She's got the raw power. All she needs to do is buy read time. Thing comes out there, yells, it's clobbering time. Everyone's like, oh, shit, here it comes. Invisible Woman puts up a, a shield. Reed comes out with some MacGuffin gadget and says, oh, everybody's powers are neutralized. Like, why are we fighting? All right. Can I tell you why you're wrong? Uh, the Justice League has two characters, Superman and the Flash, that could move uh, at speeds beyond the speed of thought. So if there ever is really a fight, you think there's going to be a fight, and everybody's dead then because Superman and Flash have taken them out. <laughs> That's how it should go. So is that who you voted for was the Justice League? That's who I would pick. If it's a legit fight, like, oh, we're going to... 
Oh, we're all dead now. Superman. <laughs> 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 So you do like versus segments, after no, all. That's stupid. That would be a terrible that was, story. It, that was the perfect response to a versus. You just sat down and you said why they would win. Look at you. No, it's so dumb. Also, <laughs> Superman and the Flash having that much power, also dumb. Uh, who did you vote for, J.A., in the end? I voted for the ultimate winner. It was the X-Men at 45% with Justice League. 32 percent no one agreed with your theory on reed richards fantastic four came in yeah and the avengers were just forgotten and even though they've got heavy hitters everyone was like meh avengers it was a popularity contest again like the wolverine they were like that's what i said it's what i said you never go against the x-men in a vote because goes back to my theory about everyone who votes in our polls they came of age in the 80s and 90s so they got that x-men cartoon show yeah. and that has imprinted on them or they they're got- just part of the universe of misfit toys that spend their time on twitter like we do and <laughs> they tend to gravitate towards x things that's true that that's true too but yeah I mean, you're right. If you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, you got the best of the X-Men. You got the X-Men cartoon. You got the Chris Claremont. You got the Jim Lee. It was... You got the X-Men arcade game, which was yeah. the bomb. Yeah. Based on the other cartoon where Wolverine had the Australian accent. I might. <laughs> ah! And then, of course, like, obviously, then the, the Justice League come in because that's to Chad's point. If you're going to just raw power. They have Wonder Woman, they have Superman, they have the Flash, they have Green Lantern, they have, like, a pantheon of gods. And, like, all the other teams maybe have... Like, that, and also Martian like, Manhunter. Some, I was to say, and Batman. Yeah, yeah Batman's just Batman. hanging out with the utility belt. Bat- Batman plus time equals win. That's, that's the worst <laughs> argument ever. That's the... Batman plus time could beat God. I was just like, no, really? See. <laughs> Well, he has a spray in the utility belt. Here's my anti-deity spray. Just bring that out here. Just (laughs) spray that in the air. Smells like potpourri. Any case, we hope that you come back to the Last Comic Shop's Twitter page, at Last Comic Shop, every single week for a wonderful weekly poll that J.A. is nice enough to put out for us. Uh, Coming up next, after these commercial breaks, we've got the review of Plunge by uh, Joe Hill and Stuart Eminem. So stay tuned for that. Hi, I'm Kevin DeCristofano. And I'm Sean Flanagan. And we are the Ninja Turtle Nerds, your weekly podcast covering the Ninja Turtle comic book series one issue at a time. Plus the video games, the cartoon show, the VHS tapes. If it's Ninja Turtles, we'll cover it. Ninja Turtle Nerds is available wherever you get your podcast. Hey all, I'm Frank. Join me and my friends as we talk about all things geek. Here at Geek Freaks Podcast, we go over the weekly news of everything in geekdom. From movies to TV, video games, and comic books. We also have a growing YouTube community. Join us as we go over everything in your geek life and share in the love of geekdom. back with more of the last comic shop and it is now time for our read power review yes that time of every single show where we give you a comic book that you should check out at your local comic book shop and in this month especially if you're into the horror if you're into the spooky and the supernatural and all that crazy wonderful stuff basically kept the comic book industry afloat for many years back in the late 40s, early 50s with like EC Comics and Vault of Horror and Tales from the Crypt and all that stuff. Man, Joe Hill put out a line in 2019 for DC Comics. It was called Hill House Comics, and they were bringing back horror comics to one of the big two. And on today's program, we're going to be talking about his contribution to that line. It was a six-part series called Plunge, which he did with the wonderful Stuart Eminem, which I, did he come out of retirement for this, or did he retire after this, Chad? No, I believe this was was post his retirement from all the Marvel books and stuff. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, Joe Hill also write, wrote uh, a lot of the other books in the Hill House comics, so it wasn't just this one. Right. He was pretty uh, pretty busy at that time. But this was, again, an opportunity for one of the big two publishers to put out a horror line. 
which I thought was a really great idea, not because I'm a huge fan of horror, but just because I'm a huge fan of inclusivity. I just want there to be as many comic books out there that appeal to different folks that are possible. So, like, again, if you were coming to D.C. and you didn't want to read Capes, well, here was another line that you could read. But unfortunately, it's not really around anymore, is it, Chad? Well, so there was a sequel to Basket Full of Heads called Refrigerator Full of Heads that came out in 2021 into 2022. But yeah, most of the little sublines that DC had cooking, they had things like Gerard Way's Young Animal in Prince that uh, is where Doom Patrol basically got rebooted, uh, and then Hill House Comics. They were all kind of smushed in under the Black Label line and then eventually just kind of phased out. Now the Black Label does stuff with like, here's a dark story about Batman. It's less weird genre stuff and off the beaten path stuff as it is like, no, here's your regular superheroes, but darker. Right. So, yeah, it was kind of a, a little bit of a casualty of a variety of different things that I think happened in 2020. Like, again, the reshuffling of the deck by DC when they were bought out by AT&T originally. And then obviously COVID happened and uh, Dan Didio being fired from DC. I think all those things played a part. And it's sad. That's just my commentary for today's show. It's sad, (laughs) you know, whether they're successful or not. I like it when especially a big two publisher like Marvel or DC will branch out and try to get other folks that aren't into capes to pick up comics. I think it's good for the industry. Well, I was going to say, the good news on that front is you do have a ton of other publishers out there that are putting out good horror books. I mean, you've got Boom with things like Something is Killing the Children and the House of Slaughter and all those Tinian books. Yeah. Uh, Once in Future. But there is a, a very vibrant market for horror. I know places like AWA and Upshot and stuff like that have some really solid horror books out there. So if you are a horror fan, don't despair if you're not getting it from the big two. There are plenty of places that have solid horror outlets. It's just you have to dig a little bit deeper to find them. Yeah, and speaking of uh, Something is Killing the Children, I think we're going to be reviewing that book in the next couple of weeks before we get out of the Halloween season. But getting back to this week's show and this week's book, what's that 10 cent synopsis for Plunge, J.A.? Before I kick off the synopsis, I just want to say, kids, this is actually a pretty mature book. There's some adult themes involved, so you have been warned. Okay, so Plunge is essentially... If you like The Thing, John Carpenter's The (laughs) Thing, it it, it channels a lot of those similar vibes. There's a giant tsunami that kicks off the series, and this tsunami unearths this ship that was lost in the 80s that's sending out a emergency signal. So the company goes and sends a recovery crew in this disputed area outside of Russia in an atoll, and it's cold. And they go in, and weird stuff starts happening. There's dead zombies walking around, but they turn out to not be zombies. They're dead people from the ship that was lost, but they've got parasitical worms in them. The worms then take over and start talking to the crew, and they want the crew to help the worms open this portal because the worms can't do it. And there's a company guy who's all interested in keeping the worms when every movie you've ever seen says don't trust the worm people the worm (laughs) people are evil (laughs) don't trust the worms (laughs) stay away from the worms and so then it's salvagers versus worm people versus company man i won't give the ending away but it feels like classic 70s paranoia sci-fi horror yeah that's why I liked it. As I as I mentioned at the top of the show, this was a book that I've wanted to review on our podcast for several years now. I think since 2019 when it actually came out. And I've been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And I finally wanted to read it. And I really, really did enjoy it. Uh, it did feel very cinematic to me. Stuart Eminem's art really does help a lot because, again, he can draw a hell of an image And he keeps, you know, the flow and the creepiness going. That's the weird thing. Is it because we're all afraid of death 
and that our corpses will be eaten by worms at some point, that every single time there are zombies or evil bad bugs, they're always worms. It's like these worms coming into our brains and, and eating our brains and taking us over. It's, I think it's because we're just afraid of dying. Like, that, we will be worm food eventually. I, I, I don't know. Um, it does it does tie into it. I mean, you see, I mean, the way Alien does it, a lot of movies, like, whenever... We don't like things entering our ears, entering our mouth, <laughs> entering our nose, entering our eyes. That freaks us out. Yeah. And, and so they play with that. And that great imminent art. There's even a scene where they, they put these worms into these. And it like drills into the one eye socket. It comes out the other one. It's it's disturbing. But you forgot about my favorite part of this book, which is the math. Uh, the, the, no, not the oh, math. There is a lot of math, though. No, well, yeah, it's just at the beginning, it. and then it gets lost. Like, after issue three, there's no math. Like, what happened to the math? I thought there would be math. I was I waiting know. to find out what the whole point of them discovering the end of Pi was. Uh, because they was... made a point about that, and then nothing. Right. We'll get, I'll get that when I get to my rating. I, that's, that's, Sorry, yeah. I, just, I derailed you. Carry on. Uh, it's not I... about the math. I was going to say it was about they give you three of those hardworking Joes and I love how at the beginning they say that they're like the the crew from Jaws. He's like I'm the Hooper character that he's the Brody and he's definitely the Quint. And you can tell you know the, the that's those are good archetypal characters to to field your team of protagonists. And then of course they've got a wonderful kick-ass woman that like helps them out and you have that versus worms and extraterrestrial threats and like all that kind of hp lovecraft cthulhu kind of stuff that kind of like there's like a scene where they find like this totem pole under the water and i was like oh my god it's that totem pole thing like it's like i don't know what that is but that's bad news that's where they would do the sacrifices I, I, I don't know. I loved it, guys, but you're gonna kill me on this math subplot. I, no, I, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna kill you. I thought uh, a lot of it. It was fun. It, it was a fun read. It kept me turning the pages. There were some sort of themes, universal themes we see. The totem poles. I'm like, oh, I saw that. I've seen that in Aliens, or you know, I've seen that in this movie. I've seen that in that movie. And that's why I say it really reminded me of like you know, paranoia '70s sci-fi, in a good way. I just felt. That as a book series, and usually I I don't complain when things are over in six issues because I feel like there's too much padding in modern comics. This, I could have used a couple of more issues. They could have pulled on the threads a bit. When they got towards the end, the last two issues, when you find out what the bugs are after and uh, the hero channels Kurt Russell in the thing and is going and killing all of them. I was like, uh, it, it just wraps up too neatly. What about all the math? Because the first two <laughs> issues, there was all this math, and it was a plot point. So I was waiting for it to become resolved. Why did we care that Pi got resolved by these aliens? Why did it matter that all these numbers, that they kept finding people you know, who, who left the colony with numbers written all over the place, right? It, it felt like he had had that plot going, and then he just forgot about it to, to wrap up the series. Yeah, and another subplot they totally ditched, the boatload of dicks! I want to go! <laughs> <laughs> We're promising the first issue a boatload of dicks, and then that doesn't come back into play. Oh, well, they had they ended up having one dick, like they had the company man. He was a colossal dick. Like ah, uh, Chekhov's gun. You're gonna show me a boatload of dicks in the first issue. That better come around at the end, <laughs> literally and figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> Ah. Oh, man. Maybe that was what the ingot was at the end. I mean, they did say that ultimately, if you saw this ingot, which is one of the major plot points, like there's this thing that if anybody sees it, oh, my gosh, they will tear out people's eyes to get it. Like, it's yeah. it's, it's crazy. Precious. Maybe it was that, just a very small dildo, like a very small. <laughs> I that, mean, that plot point kind of reminded me of that was like the, the Michael Crichton element. Ah, of the book. Yeah, no, I can see that. I can see but, that. Like, I, I didn't understand what was. Why did they bother with the Russians? There was no point for them to show up other than to get eaten. Yeah. There's uh-huh. no and, and to give us one page of them talking in maybe Cyrillic. I don't know. I couldn't read it. Um, yeah. I tried to translate 
So I don't know if it's uh, if it was real Russian or not. But you're right. Like they, they keep talking about the Russians. Like they're kind of like the boogeyman. Like they don't want to know about. Like we have to keep this all hush hush so that the Russians don't come and shoot us and things. And there's that great line by the the, the captain who's like, "You realize that salvage in somebody else's waters? That's called pirates." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's that's why I liked it. This is Joe Hill. He comes from that awesome Stephen King bloodline. There is some great lines of dialogue. There is some great pacing. This makes you turn pages. Like, can you guys at least agree with me on that? If this was a movie, you'd want to see how it ended. Chad? I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think there were too many words. There was too much math. There were simultaneously too many and not enough dicks. There are things I'm promised early on that don't follow through in this story. For me, like, this seems like your late 70s, early 80s horror homage fest. You take some of The Thing, you take some of Jaws, you know, you take a little bit of, like, Alien, you know, sprinkle in some Cthulhu, and then add math and dildos and the precious from Lord of the Rings. And then at the end of the day, it's like, wow, there was a lot of words and math in this story, and I don't know. <laughs> oh... I couldn't disagree more, but I I respect that. Th- this wasn't one of those ones where it wasn't in your wheelhouse, was it? Ch- I mean, you're not a huge horror fan to begin with, Chad, but like, it seems like your points aren't just about the fact that it was horror related. It was like, no, there were some other things going on here. Well, it might it actually might spring from the fact that like, you know, I've seen the thing, I've seen Jaws, and like, those are entertaining unto themselves. And I wonder how many other things are they pulling homages from? that I might not be picking up on that make that thing, you know, like, oh, that's cool. That's a good Cthulhu reference, like, that I'm just not picking up on. But it just seemed to me that the promise of the book didn't really pay off. We had all these different red herrings going on. But, you know, the wrap-up of the story was so swift and so neat, and it's like, oh, that's what it was all about? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I was definitely left disappointed. And then early on, I felt like I had to work for it. I had to work to get into the story. There were a lot of words there. And there was like the Stuart Inman and art is good. But even that at points, there's one scene where, so they have this dead body and they, they put it in the room of the ship or whatever. And the dead body comes to life and gets an ax. And you see the dead body with the ax. And then the next panel is the other guy with the ax sticking out of his head. And like, but you missed the part where the dead body guy gets the guy with the ax. No. And like, and that encapsulates this book. There's something missing. There's not enough. Like Jay had mentioned, maybe it needed another issue or two, but it, I had to work so hard to get into the premises that by the time everything wrapped up, it didn't make it worthwhile to be dealing with all those dicks for, for this. <laughs> I totally forgot about the ax man. Yes. I was like, why does that guy have an ax in his head all of a sudden? Why didn't we see that scene? How how cool would that scene be with the guy chopping the other guy in the head with an axe? Again, to your homage to 1970s horror and sci-fi stuff, J.A., a lot of the times you wouldn't see the axe actually go in the head. Maybe Stuart could have added the panel where the axe is coming up, and then they cut. And the next thing you see is the axe. You, uh, you no, no. I, at that point, the I, I the want head. the thunk. You want the, the thunk. whole point of an axe is that it makes a thunk. I don't even need the thunk, but I want the swing. Like, I don't need the connecting panel. I don't need the gore. But, like, zombie guy has an axe in one panel. And then the next panel, dude has axe in his head. And it's like, wait, there's something in between there that we all missed. <laughs> we, missed the, we missed the whoosh. We missed the here's Johnny. Oh, man. Uh, Well, as I said, we're going to get to our ratings right after these commercial breaks. We're going to wrap up what we all thought of Plunge. I'm thinking you can probably guess what those ratings are going to be, but stick around for that and recommendations. Stay tuned. Interruption in progress. Now hijacking into ANS 2.0 Immersion Rig. Now simulating the amazing nerd show. Featuring comments. (laughs) Batman's like, you're safe here and everything, but the Joker all of a sudden pulls out a gun and shoots himself. Movies. People fight with lightsabers. What the hell do you want? I mean, you're every. I mean, in every one of these movies, there's a lightsaber battle. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm going to rewatch it a million times. Yeah. I'm just saying, <laughs> give me something more. Wrestling. That would be awesome. Oh my god. Just a monster. <laughs> Fans would be like, holy, what the hell's going on? What happened to Jericho? <laughs> 
horror. It starts off like any other like home invasion type of story, and then it just goes crazy. And more. Hey, this is Christian. Hey, this is Dan. And we are the Amazing Nerd Show. Make sure to download us on all your favorite podcast platforms. All right, we're back with more of The Last Comic Shop, and it is now time for our ratings, where we're hoping that you don't go deep-sea salvaging and find some sort of horrible Cthulhu-type monster that wants to come up and then fill you full of worms. So, the one out of four scale, J.A., what is it this week? Well, uh, you alluded to it. It's all about salvage. I would be remiss if I didn't give the scale as one out of four salvaged dildos. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah! It's a major plot point, Chad, that doesn't go anywhere. (laughs) I I would point out, Chad kept saying dicks this entire show. It's not dicks. They're dildos. (laughs) There's a difference. Okay, okay. (laughs) Elephant-sized! Oh, man. Did anybody also catch the fact that the name of the boat is the Mech Ready? <laughs> From the thing? That's Well, the character's yeah. name is Carpenter, and then the other boat is the Durlith. That's a horror guy. Yeah. All kinds of a monster. Yeah, right. a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of sly references. When you yeah, but it. the dildos weren't named anything. <laughs> but they are just as scary. Anyway, carry on. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we're going to start off with Chad, because I feel like this might be a review sandwich. So let's get that moldy part of the piece of bread. Chad, what's your rating for oh, fun? Oh, man, O'Day. Okay, so I'm going to preface this by saying I did not hate this book. It, you know, it wasn't a bad read, but I did think that it was wordy. And as much as I love Stuart Eminem in art, and he does a fantastic job in this book where you have a cast of, like, basically human characters. There's no outlandish costumes or whatever. You could tell who every character was and when. You know, the storytelling is on point. There's that one uh, point with the Axeman, which maybe that's a horror reference that I didn't pick up. But like, I, I didn't hate this book, but at the same time, I didn't love it either. You could tell that these guys have done better stuff elsewhere. There's a lot of talent. There's a lot of potential here. But I do feel like this one, a lot of it is left on the bottom of the sea for someone else to salvage. You know, it doesn't all come together. They make promises at the beginning, whether it's finding the end of pie and doing these math theorems. Too much reading at the beginning, you'd be like, okay, I have to prep for all this stuff. And then there wasn't the payoff that I wanted. But it wasn't bad. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. So I'm going to say two and a half elephant-sized dildos for my rating for Joe Hill and Stuart Eminem's Plunge. Okay. Yeah, we'll call those King Kongs. How about that? (laughs) (laughs) Jay, what is? I think you're going to be the middle part of this sandwich. Yeah, I'm sort of in agreement with a lot of what Chad said. I really did love the art. You know, I grew up on the on this kind of story. So, yeah, a lot of the homage aspects of it I liked. And as I said earlier on, it was a, a real page turner. So I can't go less than 2.5. But then again, there were these threads that were left unfulfilled or they they went nowhere it was like why did we care about the math it's gone away now so i'm gonna say you know like it's it's a two seven five two eight five oh yeah you know it's it's got a battery but maybe the battery is low so it's not it's not <laughs> <laughs> that quite as powerful oh the, wow. the solar power but only gets so much light during the day, like the boat. It's getting it's getting a little uh, no, safe for work up in this joint. That's all right. That's okay. It's the Halloween season. I mean, people dress up like uh, sexy vampires and sexy ketchup bottles. It's, it's fine. You know, I'll be the other half of the bread, and I'm not going to say this was the best book that I ever read. Trust me, the amount of books that we've read this year that I've given fours to that would put it in the same category as a mouse, which no, that, that that's not what this is. But I will give it a solid 3.5. Oh, yeah. Regardless of whether there's plot points that don't go everywhere, regardless of whether it's a homage to some other you know movie that we may have seen before, at the end of the day, if you're reading comic books for just pure escapism, that you just want to be told a story that, like a movie, 
it gives you at least a conclusion. Like, you know, maybe that conclusion is wrapped up way too fast and some things, you know, you know, highlighted in the conclusion, but at least it gives you a satisfying conclusion. Like you're like, okay, like this happens. I, I feel like this is kind of like a popcorn comic. We say that all the time about movies, right? Like this is a popcorn movie. Unfortunately, comic books are a medium where you do have to pay attention. You have to read. So like unlike movies where you just put it on and, you know, maybe fall asleep for 15 minutes, you can't really do that with a comic book. But I wish you could because that's what this is. It's like watching, I don't know, Super 8, right? Everybody said that Super 8, when that came out by J.J. Um, Abrams, that was just like a retread of everything that Steven Spielberg did in like the late 70s, early 80s with things like E.T. and the Close Encounters. I loved it, though. And that's what they do with Stranger Things, too. And people love that. So that's that's all plunge is. Like, if you like those things, here, here's more. And which I think is great for a comic book series that, again, if you don't want to read capes and you just want to read a comic book series, go pick plunge up. You'll be entertained. I definitely think I was at least entertained. Uh, other things that you might be entertained with on The Last Comic Shop are our recommendations. Yes, these are the comic books that you can pick up in your spare time that might uh, give you joy. Like maybe an elephant-sized dildo. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and start off with J.A. Scott. Because, again, not only does he have a great book, but I think it's one of those ones that you can watch it, too, right? It's one of those ones. Yes, I'm actually really excited this week because what I am recommending, it's a Netflix series now. Uh, but it started out as a Philippine comic. It's called Trece. <laughs> And it is about this detective who is called out whenever there is a crime or a murder in Manila that might have some kind of occult overhanging. So the first story, uh, both in the comic and in, in the Netflix show, is basically there's a ghost haunting this intersection. And then the detective comes and, and she ends up fighting with some demons. What I love about it is... It's set in the Philippines. It was made by Filipinos. It feels sort of like, you know, that cross between Files and Constantine. It's black and white. It's gritty. And, you know, it's set in the city that I live in. So uh, I I like that, too. If you get it on Netflix, if you have a Netflix account you, you or you're borrowing your sister's or brother's or mother's Netflix account... <laughs> You can watch it in English or you can watch it in Tagalog. So if you want to watch it in in the original Filipino uh, with subtitles, you can do that too. So so my uh, recommendation is Trece 1, uh, Murder on Balate Drive. It is by Budget Tan and Kajo Baldesimo. But uh, they've got like seven or eight volumes out. And each volume, it's about four different stories that are self-contained murder stories essentially yeah you got you got to see if you can get those those guys on the last comic shop i don't know how but like let's see well, i don't know they they they're, they're they've got that big debt oh okay yeah, yeah. that is top. true well uh for my recommendation this week is it's again it's something else that you can quasi watch on a streaming service if you happen to have disney plus you can actually go out and you can watch rise of skywalker and um, this week's uh, uh, recommendation for me is if you're one of those folks that, unlike me, just kind of likes to complain about Star Wars and like what they don't like and stuff like that. For me, there is no bad Star Wars. That just means more Star Wars. I'm happy with it. But if you're one of these people that, you know, whether you're watching Andor and now you're making comparisons to maybe that show's great and how Rise of Skywalker's crap or or maybe, oh, I like this or whatever. Uh, if you want an alternative version of Rise of Skywalker, you can read Star Wars Duel of the Fates, which was a fan-made comic. wasn't officially released. So, like, I'm not going to tell you where you can find it because I don't know if it actually breaks, you know, some things or whatever by its existence it's kind of like what john burns doing with his elsewhen like he i think this person did it for non-profit anyways but regardless a guy named andrew weingarten he took the original script for duel of the fates which was written by colin trevorrow and uh, Derek Connolly. he basically illustrated into seven issues 
it's somewhat different from Rise of Skywalker, where, you know, Ray has a relationship with Poe. There's a lot more Rose in this one. Finn has a lot more to do. There's a revolution on Coruscant. They go to Mortis, which if you're fans of the uh, Star Wars Clone Wars TV show, you know that's where, like, the light and the dark spring from. There's a scene where Ray goes into the Force because she ends up dying for a few seconds. And, and I don't know. It, it, again, it was written even before Carrie Fisher died. So, like, there's a lot of parts in it that probably would have had to been rewritten after Carrie Fisher. But this was the original script. And, and, and like some other books that we've covered on The Last Comic Shop, such as, like, the 9-11 Commission Report, some people might not want to read a script. But if you can get it in illustrated form, and I won't lie, I mean, Andrew does a, a very good job with the art. And so kudos to him for doing this. But if you want to read what that movie would be like, try to find Duel of the Fates. Uh, again, that was the original name of the book. I think that was a play off of that particular song from Phantom Menace. Like Colin evidently knew a lot about Star Wars mythology up to that point. Is it better than Rise of Skywalker? Is it worse? It's just different. It's like an Elseworlds tale. Just accept it for that and, and enjoy it. If you like Star Wars, here's more Star Wars. Any case, Chad, what is your recommendation this week? All right, kids. So my recommendation this week, similar to how the plunge was genre fiction and the horror genre, and similar to how plunge promised on math, mine is going to be a different genre, but also uh, it does include the math. My story is called A Calculated Man by uh, Aftershock Comics. Paul Tobin is the writer. Alberto Albuquerque is the artist. It is actually still in production currently, so you could probably find the issues on the racks at your comic shop as you are hearing this. But it is the story of Jack Beans. And Jack Beans is someone who has synesthesia, where he sees numbers as colors. And his memory is absolute. He can remember everything he's ever seen or heard. Uh, and then the other tricky part about Jack Beans is he cannot tell a lie. And because he had all this talent with numbers and had this great memory, he was a wonderful asset for the mob and keeping their numbers clean and doing all the money laundering that they wanted to do. But the problem is he wants out. And so uh, the mob that he is working for, I believe it's the Van Dykes, or no, it's the Keys. It's the Keys. The Van Dykes are a different group of mobsters that all have the Van Dyke beards. But anyway, the Keys, they keep following him. And so Jack Beans comes to the natural conclusion, the only way he will ever be out is to kill all the mobsters. And so you have a gangster revenge book. Uh, it is tons of fun. There is lots of math throughout the book. They don't abandon it after issue three. But it is just a fun. If you enjoy gangster revenge stories... There are lots of things within that genre, but it's like if you took that and crossed that with Rain Man and let chaos and fun ensue. But it comes out from Aftershock Comics. It is called A Calculated Man. Uh, it is definitely worth your time. There you go. And one other thing that's definitely worth your time is rate reviewing and subscribing to The Last Comic Shop so you never miss any of our episodes every single week. Yes, again, all the rest of this month, we're going to have some other Halloween-related comic books. So if you're a fan of that, uh, we've got things like Frankencastle lined up. We've got things like Something is Killing the Children. We've also got Black Adam because that's a movie, but... I don't know. Maybe it's got some horror aspects. It's got Dr. Fate, and he's supernatural. Maybe. There you go. Yeah. Uh, it's horrifying that we're going to have to read a Black Adam comic. <laughs> <laughs> <That counts right. laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, J.A. So was true. commenting on, like, this is one of those movies, like, he's going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming to because, like, he has absolutely no interest in seeing this. Right? There's the, not even Pierce Brosnan. Not even Pierce. Not even a James Bond I don't know. I, I no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> Timothy Dalton. Oh, shots fired. Golden eye, not lace, no leather. <laughs> <laughs> Any case, we don't have lace or leather out on the last comic shop, but you can check us out every single week by just again going out to www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com. It's our terrific website where you can find everything. Yes, everything. 
And if you need more than that, you can head out onto the socials that we are at Last Comic Shop on Twitter and Instagram uh, and Facebook, which just directs you to our Twitter or Instagram. But you could find things like our weekly polls that Jay puts up, or you could find awesome Golden Age covers to help put you to bed at night, uh, or just the random rumblings and goings on uh, talking about the world of comic books. Don't know where that is? Head back to the home base, www.lastcomicshoppodcast.com, where they can find what else, J.A.? Links to our merch store. We've got our Halloween special t-shirt on sale, Bats in the Belfry. It's very popular. It looks smashing in maroon. It just pops. Don't have a special on dildos. Sorry. You have to go somewhere else for those. But we do have coffee mugs and tote bags. Yes, exactly. So So if you need something to tote your dildo around in, come to us. (laughs) No, please don't. (laughs) There's got to be other outlets out there. Right, exactly. Use a plastic bag or something. Okay, okay. All right, let's move on. While we might be the last comic shop, we actually don't want to be the last comic shop. So we encourage you guys to go out to your local uh, shops near you and find some cool stuff. Maybe that involves Plunge by Joe Hill and Seward Eminent. Maybe that would be Trace A, Murder on Balete Drive. Check out that show on Netflix as well. If you want to search for Aftershocks, A Calculated Man. Or maybe you want to go outside of your local comic shop and dig on the internet a little bit for the Duel of the Fates to get your Star Wars fix and see what would have been. So some of that is waiting for you potentially at your local comic shop. Don't know where that is? Use the comic shop locator at www.comicshoplocator.com to find some cool stuff. And until next week, I was the host with most Andy Larson. I was joined by Chad Smith and Jay Scott. And we hope that you stay safe. Stay away from the worms. Yeah. Stay away from the worms. They hate these worms. I think the worms hate us. Isn't that the, the problem right. of the book? Hey, and if you're out on social media, make sure that if you want to ever see a picture of Chad dressed up like the tick, let us know and we might send you pictures. If you ever wanted to see a, something extra large wrapped up in rubber, all you need to see is Chad as the tick. Oh, let's not, we're not putting that out there on the internet. <laughs> there were no secrets in that costume. No <laughs> secrets. <laughs> The last comic shop was a 2022 Black Angus production.